in between the political and the educational decline, I would like to summarize for you in a few sentences what I said in regard to the political decline. Particularly in regard to the era 1870 to 1970. If you will note, there have been several factors working together and in combination to produce the situation in which we are today. The first of these is, of course, the advent of Darwinism, which gave to the American intellectual uh, an alleged scientific evidence for the concept of progress. This was not, the idea of progress was not new. It had been held in the Jacksonian period. It had been even evident in, in Jefferson's phrase, uh, uh, a new order of the ages, which had been drafted and printed on our first American paper currency. But it received a tremendous impetus with the advent of Darwinism. The idea of a messianic progress had, of course, been inherent in uh, Jacksonian democracy. And the second point I would make is this, that it was also inherent in the post-millennial theology of the 19th century. Post-millennial theology very easily lent itself to radicalism. It fitted in very well with the Darwinian thesis and it could be very easily used. And if you trace the history of 19th century post-millennial thought, you will see that it gradually became secularized, and more particularly after 1870, and thus became one of the weapons which the secularists used against historic orthodoxy. In the third place, the democratic philosophy itself attended toward this direction. And it, when you take all these factors together, you will see that by 1890, there was in the air a secularized messianic uh, millennialism, which permeated the thinking of the political parties. So that after 1900, you have this amalgamation into popular political slogans. You have, for instance, uh, the square deal of Franklin Roosevelt. You have the new freedoms of Woodrow Wilson. You have the new deal of Franklin Roosevelt. You have the fair deal of Harry Truman. And the new frontiers, the great society, and so on. Uh, Mr. Nixon didn't coin a phrase, but on the foreign front, as I heard him say on at least three different occasions, after Mr. Kiss Mr. Kissinger's various trips, he uh, promised that there would be perpetual peace in our time. He didn't promise a, a, a domestic national millennium, but he certainly promised an international millennium, uh, which he and Kissinger would arrange. Uh, and apparently had arranged with peace in the Mideast. At least that was what I got out of those statements. Maybe you didn't agree with me. Uh, so that, um, you see, it only rested then for the politicians to respond to this. Now, if you will take the major political party platforms, as well as the communists, the socialists, and socialist labor party platforms, after 19, well, beginning with 1912, and perhaps even before, they were promising a millennium. Just elect us, and it will be delivered to you, come the first session next Congress. Now, this in turn resulted in the fact that the political parties, having promised this type of a millennial existence to the nation, then fashioned political party platforms uh, to reflect this messianic hope. And in so doing, they paid no attention to the federal constitution of any kind. They paid no attention to the real American pivot in political tradition and simply promised pie in the sky, pie on the table, and dead pigs and dead cows in the fields under Henry Wallace. Um, so that they were going to have a millennium come what may. Uh, 
Uh, if you read a very important book uh, by Henry Wallace, published in 1935, uh, incidentally, it was so radical that it was published in Great Britain and shipped back to this country, <laughs> in which his uh, communist uh, sympathies and radical program uh, were very clearly revealed. Incidentally, in 1935, that same year, he gave an address to the Federal Council of Churches, uh, which was about as radical, but uh, it was not printed as a book, but it was reported in the Christian Century and was reprinted in the Federal Council book for, I think, July of that year. Anyway, you see what happened was that these various forces produced a secularized millennialism, millennialism, which in turn simply allowed or encouraged or forced, as you may desire the word, the political parties to write in their platforms promises which were utterly incapable of being realized. Roosevelt was going to abolish poverty and everything else by legislation. And where Roosevelt failed, Truman would pick up the slack and push it to success. Where Truman failed, Eisenhower would succeed. Where Eisenhower failed, Kennedy would rush into the breach. And where Kennedy failed, Johnson would succeed. All these men and I'm not excluding Nixon, although he says less about the, 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 uh, the domestic front because he was concerned with foreign policy. Uh, all these men were, were using this messianic, this secularized messianic hope to bring about a totalitarian regime because they were promising political, social, and economic panaceas, which could not possibly be accomplished under constitutional government and which by their very nature were breaking down the whole concept of sphere sovereignty because the government was going to invade business, the government was going to invade the family, the government was going to invade this, that, and the other thing. And so the spheres, which uh, Morton Smith so very clearly drew for our attention, uh, broke down. You may not remember this, but at one time, the New Deal even invaded the sphere of art and decorated the newly built post offices with huge murals. I remember very distinctly the one at Johnson City, and you may remember that, the, the big mural they had there of the, of the covered wagon and the Western Pioneers, as if they had suddenly taken off from Johnson City, Tennessee, over beyond the Great Missouri. Uh, which they didn't. Uh, they had they had a New Deal theater. They had a New Deal art program, largely for post offices and other government bureau buildings. Uh, uh, not too long ago, they painted they painted our our post office inside a hideous paint uh, and aroused the citizenry to heights of indignation because of the glaring colors which greeted you as you walked in the door. The glaring pink sought to conceal the deteriorating service, I think. <clears throat> the whole concept of sphere society broke down as the government invaded more and more spheres. And whether you realize this or not, it is important to note that under ATW, the government is vigorously attacking the home. Vigorously attacking the home. Head start, home start, and all the other starts, full starts, and by that, <laughs> are all designed to to achieve this. This opinion was voiced by a prominent official of ATW, and apparently is shared by many within that group. Certainly, this in Western California, in a dress in Maryland, that he was going to drive religion out of the American schools and out of the American home. He also said that any student who believed in God was sick, and they had ways of, de ways of dealing with that in the schools. Now, this is on public record. I did not make this up. Now, 
With that in view, I would then discuss with you, in transition, the history of the decline of education, hopefully in one in one half or less hours, so that I may take up the really basic issue of all my lectures, and that is the decline in theology. Colonial America was the heir of the educational thought and practice of the Reformation, which in time, of course, at points, depended heavily upon its, refer its medieval heritage. <laughs> now, and when I say this, as in other lectures, I'm not merely speaking of the Puritans of New England, for I have sought to point out to you that this concept of education lay heavily upon the middle colonies, upon Virginia, at William and Mary, and uh, later schools in North and South Carolina, it lay heavily upon all of these. Many people make a great point that North and South China and Virginia did not have public schools. If your nearest neighbor was 55 miles away, you wouldn't have a public school either. As a matter of fact, you probably wouldn't have a private Christian school. All education, except in Charleston and in Williamsburg, and in a few other towns like that in Wilmington, had to be carried on in the home, on the plantation, uh, particularly in plantation tidewater Virginia, plantation tidewater Cape Fear, North Carolina, and so on. Now, it is true that in a few towns like Salem, in the later colonial period, I'm speaking of Salem, North Carolina, that they did have the famous Salem Academy. Uh, but but uh, that was because there was, a, there was a, an accumulation of Moravians in a, in a relatively close a geographical spot where you could afford to have a Christian private school. But ordinarily, they didn't do it. But this does not mean that they lack the educational thought or practice. Far from it. It simply means they carried out in a different locale by virtue of the geographical necessity imposed upon them. Thus, having said that, I would simply summarize by saying that this educational thought and practice was a common heritage of all the colonies. Now, what did it consist? It consisted, first of all, of a biblical belt and chain. By which I mean a biblical world and life view. By which I mean that the scriptures became the frame of reference for all educational philosophy. The primary end of education was to train young people in the Christian faith. Not only in the catechism. Not only in the scriptures as the word of God. But in what the scriptures inferred or which might be rightly deduced therefrom, to quote the Westminster Confession of Faith. They were not strictly, and did not intend to be, simply what you and I might call a, mar a modern Bible school education. To begin with, they had a very broad view of education, and of the impact and the implications of education. They had a definite dolphin shower. It is a grave mistake to think that they did not. You simply look through the New England Primer and you see a very, very excellent way of educational practice. You see through the other books and you see educational practice. Now, it is quite true that the, that the so-called school readers were based upon Scripture. A prominent educator has made a study and pointed out that down to about past 1776, the content of the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, sixth grade readers, as you and I know them, was almost entirely biblical. Uh, the sentences they taught the children to read with were biblical sentences, so that they adapted the scriptures 
for the very sound purpose of a sound education. They carried out their biblical belt and sham in a very biblical way. Their discipline and all that they had was founded upon this ideal. I'm speaking now, of course, of what we call the grammar schools. But in 1636, Harvard College was founded. As I pointed out, I think on last week sometime, Harvard was a miniature Cambridge. The men who, who founded Harvard were Cambridge graduates. All good self-respecting Puritans went to Cambridge because Cambridge was the great intellectual center of Puritanism in England. And rightly, they went there. But the colonists did not forget their English heritage. They called it New England for a very good reason. They had left England, but they were not leaving English culture. And so, in the midst of what was then the wilderness of the Charles River, they planted a school known as Harvard College. By 1676, Harvard College was achieving a dignity at home, that is in England, as well as in this country. It had an honorary, uh, which was, of course, a way of studying the plants. Uh, they had distinguished scientists, and it was a respectable, reputable center of education. Many people forget this. The whole educational process was, I would say, a successful. If you look at the southern plantations and their schools conducted in the home, uh, you will see the same thing. Uh, these men would import tutors from England, from either Oxford or Cambridge. And uh, if I would recommend to you the reading of a book known as Philip Fifteen's Diary. How many have ever heard of that book? Well, Philip Fifteen was a young English scholar who was imported by Robert King Carter of Nominee Hall, Virginia, to train all the children on the plantation. And he turned his plantation home veritably into a common school in which many children were trained, his own and everybody else who had any claim to life on the plantation. And Philip Fifteen has left a delightful uh, and intimate story of his life as a tutor on the plantation. And if you think that the rigors of educational life on the plantation were not rigorous, you need only read his diary. And if the children got out of hand, not only was the teacher empowered to deal with them, but so was the, the father backed up the, t the tutor so that the children, uh, perchance, were forced to learn willy-nilly. Uh, <laughs> what I'm saying then, and, and I must rush on, is not because I wouldn't love to linger on the colonial system of education, which is fascinating. And incidentally, when I hear people lecture in education, I nearly have, I nearly burst my sides. They have simply, they have rediscovered, uh, the middle school, and they have rediscovered, uh, the one room school. You know, about 25 years ago in North Carolina, we, we, we were getting awfully modern. We were doing away with our one room schools. Today, we're extremely modern in North Carolina. We're reinstating them because they have suddenly discovered a value in what had no value 25 years ago. I would submit that professors of education and superintendents of schools in the, in the states, particularly the state of North Carolina, if they would get a good history of education, one good history of education, they would be utterly surprised at what they're doing in the name of modernity. It's, it's unbelievable how little they know about their own history and how much money they can spend as a result of their ignorance of the history of education. Now, the content and the frame of reference of colonial education was distinctly biblical. 
one authority has estimated that 90%, some have said 100%, I think that's high, but 90% of the material presented to the students in the colonial textbook was biblical in character. You might want to think about that. It was biblical in character. And this remained true after the revolution. I'm sometimes tempted to write the Supreme Court to set them straight on the history of education. Because that's one thing, among other things, I do not know and have no idea. Not even Jefferson was able to carry the day to take the Bible out of the schools. Not only take the Bible out as a, as a textbook or as a frame of reference, but even as providing the content for education. Even down to 1865, somewhere between 50 and 60 or 75 percent of the content of textbooks provided for the public schools, such as they were, was biblical nature. This is an astounding fact. And the framers of the first ten amendments to the Constitution, including Article I of the amendments, uh, the First Amendment, were fully aware of this fact. They saw absolutely no contradiction between the Bible and public schools and the establishment of religion. Incidentally, the First Amendment does nothing but prohibit Congress from establishing a religion. It had no effect upon the states whatsoever. And this was clearly recognized. Secondly, they did not regard having the Bible in the public schools as the establishment of religion. What they did intend was to prevent Congress and Congress only from having an established national church, which would be supported by national funds derived from taxation by the federal government. They had at no time intended to deny the states the right even to have an established religion. Because, as you may remember, well up until 1833 and 1819, Massachusetts and Connecticut, by public taxation, supported of the Congregational Church. In South Carolina, the Anglican Church was supported. We need to remember that, so that at no time was the use of biblical content in a textbook or by the teacher regarded as a violation of any amendment, for actually it didn't violate the First Amendment, and the states actually, not only, I don't like to use the word connived, but they supported it. And as a matter of fact, the public demanded it. Obviously, with the rise of the common man under Jackson, the intellectual currents were set in force, which would, in their own way, undermine this development. I would not repeat Rush Denny because I think his book on the messianic character of American education is a superb piece of historical research. And I would simply urge you to read that book because it is full of great material. But he very clearly and very ably points out that beginning with uh, the educational reformers, of the 1830s and the 1840s, notably Horace Mann, notably Henry Barnard, notably Thomas Skidmore in New York, that the change set in. Horace Mann was made what we would call superintendent of education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And in the 1840s, he issued a series of famous reports to the Board of Education to be transmitted to the Massachusetts State Assembly. Now, Horace Mann was a Unitarian. He was a radical Unitarian. He was of the New England Transcendentalist variety of Unitarianism and worked closely with um, the people who founded uh, the Transcendentalist movement, notably Ralph Waldo Emerson and that group. Uh, and he envisaged the public school, 
as a totally different history. He envisaged the public school as being a, a, an instrument to refashion this country. To, he brought in, as I think Rush Judy very well maintains, the messianic concept of public education. That the, that the students belong to the state and not to the parent. That the state shall dictate what the student shall learn and, of course, what he shall not learn. How he shall learn it and for what purposes. So in, in Horace Mann, you have the beginning very clearly set forth of the idea that the state must educate its students, its young people, for the purpose of turning out good citizens. Now, this sounds like a good patriotic idea, but this is vicious. This is vicious, because who is going to determine what is good citizenship? The horse man had a very good idea of who would determine what is good citizenship, namely the state. Now, where did he get this? Well, let's remember that by 1820, Edward Everett, George Bancroft, and others had returned from Germany, where Hegelianism was fresh on their minds. And you see, Hegel taught that the person acquires his personality in the state. Thus, the ongoing state must have the desirable ongoing type of personality. Very shortly after this, Karl Marx would say, oh no, Hegel, no, no, no. He doesn't acquire his personality in the state, he acquires it in the, in the proletariat. And therefore, the proletariat shall dictate the kind of education the students shall have. But for Horace Mann, it was a Gideon idea that the state should because he is to be fitted and molded and polished to be in the state. He is to acquire his personality in the state. This is Hegelianism. And Horace Mann was fully aware of what he was doing. And by 1835, transcendentalism was in the saddle so far as many of these New England colonies were con states were concerned. Certainly, in the thinking of Horace Mann, Thomas Skidmore went a step further. He advocated uh, atheism. And he also, incidentally, advocated the, the, the juncture of the causes of labor in atheism and founded Skidmore College, a girls' school in New York, for this purpose. <laughs> so by 1840, the forces of secularism, <clears throat> under the guise of the rise of the common man, were well entrenched in American life. Now, their success did not come at once. Uh, the public school movement in the 1830s and 40s certainly was not a very prospering movement. Thaddeus Stevens pushed it in Pennsylvania in conjunction with Horace Mann in Massachusetts and other leaders emerged in other states. Uh, but they were not able to secularize the public schools. This is the time when they first brought in schools of teachers' education. They used to call them normal schools. What was normal about them? I've never been able to find out. <clears throat> when they brought in the beginning of educational literature, states like Illinois and Michigan began to <coughs> uh, bulletins on education, which they forced the teachers to buy. Uh, they began to organize teachers' groups, which they strongly suggested that the teachers should join. Coerciveness uh, to mold the teacher's mind as well as the student's mind began in the picture. But it, as I said, it did not gain great success. But gradually, the public school movement developed. But even down as to in 8, 1900, friends, if you look at the records, only about 105,000 people had graduated from high school. Now, there are reasons for this, and the ha reason is a very unhappy one. I'm speaking of no school represented here today by any of my learned friends, but today the average college probably does not do as good a job as the high school did in 1875. 
the average high school today undoubtedly fails to do as good a job as the old-fashioned grammar school did. Such has been the decline of education. I'm speaking of no school represented here. I'm speaking of the national picture. Now, you say, how can you prove this? If you will make a practice, or just once in a while investigate the type of textbook used, you'll be overwhelmingly surprised by the difficulty of a textbook, even in such matters as Latin, where Latin is still taught. Uh, the Latin textbooks today are a dehydrated version of Julius Caesar, which Julius Caesar would promptly disown and violently deny he ever written. <coughs> Uh, they're simplified to a point that Caesar would be embarrassed to think they'd ever penned those words. Cicero would not recognize his orations. Horace would never recognize his odes. And Virgil would have a stroke. Now, I do not mean to say that some good texts which are faithful to the results are not pretty, but the average high school textbook in Latin is is a sad replica of a once great language. And so it goes. You take a modern English grammar and compare it with the type of grammar they taught a hundred years ago in the eighth or ninth or tenth grade. I'm speaking of the books they sell to college people. I think I told someone last week, but uh, not too long ago, a book salesman uh, came to my office and I was trying to impress the salesman the fact that we wanted sophisticated textbooks. And I didn't want the junk they were pandering. And uh, he said, well, he looked at me. He was very embarrassed. And he said, we don't have many of those. And then he said with a bright, happy flash, he said, he said not too long ago, uh, a college professor called our office in Atlanta and asked if they had a real good college textbook in history, but written on the eighth grade level. And I can lament and sympathize with you, even as I would beg your sympathy in my problem. Because this is a very sad situation. I'm sure that my friend from the junior college would also have to agree with me. Such is the deteriorating quality of my education. Now, after the war, in 1865, the impetus toward public schools gained great strength. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens, to the extent to which he was able, uh, Horace Mann, Henry Barnard, and many others joined forces to produce chaos. Uh, still, the biblical emphasis was there. But gradually, <laughs> as Charles Hodge very clearly saw his great work, which I would beg you to read, what is Darwinism? written in 1870, as Charles Hodge so clearly saw, Darwinism was not really popular because of its scientific basis, but it was popular because it was a new dolphin challenge but designed to do away with the biblical Dalton Sham and the authority of the scriptures. This is the real secret of Darwinism. And this was seen not only by Charles Darwin, but other, I mean by Charles Hodge, but by men like Thornhill, and I should correct that more particularly Dabney, who, of course, Thornhill had died, but Dabney was still very much in evidence, very much on the scenery. These men saw this. And, of course, some men at Princeton Center also saw it and waged a valiant fight against Darwinism. Not only because of what it would do to scriptures, if accepted, but because of what it would do to American life. By 1900, the high school movement had gained great force. The secularization of the, of the curriculum was well underway. Not entirely. More so in New England and the middle class states, uh, but not too much in the South. And the South maintained its biblical tradition, probably 
as more so in other sections of the country, possibly except for the Middle West, where it remained quite strong. But in 1879, a man was born who would drastically revise the educational procedures. That man was John Dewey. Now, I do, do not mean to say that he alone did it, because in his psychological findings, in his um, first psychological laboratory, William James cooperated. Charles Sanders Pierce cooperated. Many others cooperated. But the new pragmatic Lockean psychology, in conjunction with the messianic concepts of Henry Barnard and others, Horace Mann, were going to produce a new education after World War I Dewey was appointed the head of the School of Education at Columbia University in 1916 he had produced a first edition of a book which deserves to be read if you want an insight into what was going on and this book is called Democracy in Education. Now, working using the psychology of William James and his students, using the philosophy of Hegel, and this is very important to note, however incongruous Hegel's epistemology was with that of John Locke and William James, and of course it was very contradictory, this didn't bother doing. Contradictions never bothered doing. He he conjoined together the Lockean epistemology, the Hegelian metaphysics to a degree, although he is an atheist. Uh, the the messianic concepts of 19th century democratic America, particularly Horace Mann, Henry Barnard, and others, and weld them into a system. A system designed to socialize and collectivize the American mind. Now, the first edition was written in 1916. In the meantime, he went to, after the war, he went to Russia in conjunction with a character known as Harry F. Ward, uh, the executive secretary of the Methodist Commission on Social Action and the Executive Secretary of the Department of Federal Com uh, Council of Churches and Social Action, Lincoln Stephens and others. And another man who later repented of all his ways, uh, William Bull, Bullock, who, because of his early connections with the Communist movement, incidentally was appointed as our first ambassador to Russia. There he was speedily enlightened. In fact, he became so enlightened that Stalin suggested that he might <laughs> want to be enlightened elsewhere. And so Mr. Roosevelt was forced to recall him. And Mr. Bullock then went to France, where he took a very dim view of the French. And, uh, and the, in the gathering storm of despotism in France right before the war. And they found out that maybe Mr. Bullock shouldn't really be in France. And by the time he came back to this country, he was ready to talk to anybody about communism and what it really was. And he did. Uh, but he was one of the early boys in this movement. And they came back, and although Dewey was not given to belief in God, he subscribed to Harry up words dictum that the Soviet Russia was the real place where practical Christianity was being applied. The fact that they were killing millions of Jews didn't bother him. Uh, because apparently, if uh, communists kill Jews, it's all right. It's only if Germans do it, it's wrong. <clears throat> it depends who commits the act as to the extent to which evil is attached. Incidentally, you may not know this. The last book that Karl Marx ever wrote was a diatribe calling for the execution of Jews. You cannot find it in many public libraries. In fact, I don't think you can find any. It's been systematically 
stolen from the shelves uh, because uh, in the days of Stalin, when he was busily denouncing Hitler uh, for his persecution of the Jews, it was a little bit embarrassing to find out, uh, or to have Americans find out, that Karl Marx had called for this type of thing. Of course, I would also remind you that uh, the Russians have probably killed more Jews than ever lived in Germany, or more than Hitler ever executed. The record of Soviet Russia in regard to the Jews in Poland and its own boundaries would not bear a very uh, honest uh, or demanding scrutiny. It would be extremely embarrassing. Now back to Mr. Dilley. In 1926, armed with his fresh insights into the glories of the kingdom of God, of a non-existent God, and his millennial content, he wrote a second version of Democracy and Education. This was much more open, uh, and this was much more to the point. The schools exist to, to take the malleable minds of American school students and guide them into the glories of communist collectivism. Thus, teachers, students, school boards, school superintendents must all be enlisted for the production of a better state. And the state would do the production. And the state would train its citizens. Now, there's nothing I perhaps should retract that but one of the most dangerous ideas that you can ever accept in regard to public education is the idea that it will train better citizens. To begin, it won't. And secondly, it shouldn't. To be, because for one reason, it decides, quote, what is a better, unquote, citizen. Now, in a completely relativistic frame of reference, the empirical epistemology of John Dewey, derived from John Locke, you cannot use the word better because you don't know what good is. Therefore, there's no way of drawing a comparative action in regard to it. See, uh, Dewey shouldn't use the word good. A communist cannot logically use the word good. He cannot call capitalism evil because there's neither good nor evil because there is no absolute except the absolute of dialectical materialism. Therefore, you cannot logically call anything good or evil. But these little inconsistencies never bothered doing. And he, he plowed ahead for the destruction of the American state. By 1930, he had become powerful enough through his lieutenants who were faithful to him, even unto death, uh, to form the Progressive Education Society, which was nothing more than a communist front organization. And you might as well recognize that fact. Now, I speak from experience. When I was in graduate school, I had to teach to help my way through. I landed a job in a school. I didn't realize how radical it was. A very radical, a very progressive school. And in order to educate me in the glories of progressivism, I was sent up to New York uh, to the meetings of the Progressive Education Association where I had the honor or the misfortune, whatever you want to call it, to have to listen to John Dewey's electric to his big toe because that, I think, was the only animate object in the room that could hear him. It apparently absorbed all the sound. Uh, he mumbled and grumbled, but I was sent to observe some of the, the leading progressive schools in New York City. They were sure chaos. If you do, you remember the movie Up the Down Staircase? Well, that was a very interesting um, example of what I mean. Uh, it, these schools were sure chaos. I could tell you story after story, but underneath the chaos of discipline, there was a very determined purpose, and that was to communize the students in their schools. There's no question about that. And its leadership worked directly with communist groups in this country. 
If you will get the testimony of Bella Dodd uh, given before the Smith-McCarran Committee, a subcommittee of the Federal Senate Committee on the Judiciary, given in June, July, and September 1952, and again in 1953, you will see there a tremendous description of exactly what took place and why it took place. Bella Dodd was one of the few people called before, brought, who appeared before that committee who was not called, who was not subpoenaed, and who appeared completely as a voluntary act and who told the old, her own story. It was fascinating. Utterly, I have the testimony. It is utterly fascinating testimony. She graphically outlined exactly what happened. By 1940 and 45, in this country, many school superintendents in local school districts had been trained thoroughly by Columbia University, the teacher's education department. They had also captured many school boards, they captured schools of education in most of the large universities. And she relayed graphically how they did this. They worked through Teachers College, they worked through MIT, they worked through New York University, they worked through City College of New York and Brooklyn College, they worked through uh, Tufts College, they worked through the University of Illinois, the University of Pittsburgh, the University of California, the University of Colorado, the University of Washington, and a few other schools. Uh, Tulane was another one. These were centers where they trained people and they brought them to the Jefferson School of Social Science in New York City, which was a communist organization. And here they trained these people. I say that as an aside because Bella Dodd also, and this is a very important point, the Senator Jenner of Indiana and Senator Smith of North Carolina, whom I knew personally, asked them, how, asked Bella Dodd how she got, ever got into it. Now, the reason he asked her was that she came voluntarily and offered to tell all she knew. She hid nothing. And she told very very bluntly, she had been an evangelical Lutheran. And she had been a real believer. And when she appeared before the committee, she appeared in tears. And she told her descent in this type of thing, how she'd been ensnared through the t local teachers' union, how she'd gotten in the hands of the communists of Columbia. She told the whole story. And then, and then Senator McCarran of Nevada who was a Roman Catholic, a, a fine, fine Christian man, said and asked her, well, what made you break with communism? What finally brought And she said when she realized that the communists were a hostile, traitorous organization and that they were using people, misusing people, they were not keeping their promises to even the people they had ensnared in the movements. Then she told that one day she she became so spiritually dissatisfied she returned to a Lutheran church. I do not remember the minister's name. I'm not even sure that she gave his name. But she said she recaptured her Christian faith. And she said she went and broke with the Communist Party. And then Senator... Smith said, aren't you afraid? And she said, I sure am. Because she was in danger. Instead, that was the committee before which Herb Fulbert gave his testimony. And they had to whisk him away, as you may know, uh, because of his testimony. And these, these were fascinating moments. They were frightening. But they were very clear revelation of what had happened and how they had infiltrated into the public school movement all over the country. At one time, I better not use names, but a man whom almost all of you know, or many of you know, uh, through a certain foundation, 
in North Carolina got me an appointment one summer to make an investigation of the records of Columbia University Teachers College and how they had done this. When the foundation wanted to do it, but when Columbia University, the teachers' college, found out what I was going to do, they simply closed the records to me. And I've never yet seen them. I have a pretty good idea. What would happen was a superintendent from Columbia would go into a school district. He would have a vacancy. He said, oh, yes, to the board, I know a good person, one of my, you know, conferers, one of my students at Columbia, and then he'd go. And then the whole process was repeated till schools got honeycombed with communism. Now, although the Progressive Education Association ultimately collapsed and was forced to change its mode of operation, it finally went out of existence uh, because of the pressures of the war and a new patriotism and the fact that its work was being discovered. It, uh, it has continued under various guises. Until today, education is intellectually bankrupt. American public education is intellectually bankrupt. The students who come out of it cannot read. They have no discipline in study. They cannot spell. Mathematics constitutes a profound mystery of the ages to their minds. History is something with which they're totally unacquainted. The scriptures are virtually unknown to them. The most simple questions that you might put to young people in your class in a church would be, would be an utter mystery to these people. They have no idea who Moses is. And you think I am exaggerating. I am not. They have no idea who Paul is. Sometimes they make a lucky guess and say that he was one of the disciples. Uh, well, of course, they got them in some kind of time scope. But the books of the Bible, they have no idea. They're illiterate. They're illiterate. Our college is a good college. We have a required English 100 course, which every freshman has to take. Every freshman has to pass it. They take the poorest students first in the first quarter so that they can have an opportunity to flunk it and pass it and flunk it and so on. I mean, you know, until they do. But the flunk rate in the first quarter of students who are good is 30 to 35 percent. And sometimes they flunk it for three straight quarters. And it's not because they don't teach it. I admit the faculty is doing it is rigorous. They're maintaining their standards. They, they, they have a funny idea that students who go into sophomore year should be able to use the English language. Uh, the chairman of the department, who's a good friend of mine, has that very reactionary idea that English is a vehicle of expression. Uh, he even likes the students to take Greek. So do I. I believe that history students should know Greek. And we have a resurgence of Greek for this reason. Now, modern education is intellectually bankrupt. It is morally disreputable. When I was working with Cornelius Van Til one summer, I went faithfully to my Kiwanis Club. Um, and they had an evening meeting up there, not too far from the seminary. And the night I was there, they had the federal agent in charge of the youth and drugs for that area. And he spoke to the Kiwanis Club, and he said to the teachers, there were some school principals present, about 100 in the club, maybe 150. And he said, you are guilty. You know there are drugs in the sixth grade. You know this. You do nothing about it. And unfortunately for him, a junior high school principal got up and protested, and he said, Sir, I know you personally, and I know the conditions in your own school, and I know that you're doing nothing about it. And that man sat down fast. He had nothing to say. Um, 
They are more destructive. Not only do they tolerate things, but I took occasion to look at some of the textbooks where pornography is very thinly concealed, where sexual looseness is, it is nothing uh, to be uh, to be abhorred, uh, where other forms of uh, immorality are, are are tolerated. In spite of all the brave talk that they're against drugs, they're not. They're too, they're too fearful, they're too scared to take a stand against anything. And as for turning out good citizens, they do not know the word citizenship, let alone the word good. To me, as I look at the situation today, I would say that probably public education in this country is public enemy number one. That has done, there's no agency in the country which has done more to undermine the American nation, the American morale, and even the intelligence of the nation than the public school. Now, how has this happened? Dewey laid the groundwork. William J. Kilpatrick and others followed hard upon Dewey's heels and speedily saw that the schools could be avenues of manipulation. With the advent of behaviorism, in quote the word I do not like, the social scientists, much of modern education has become nothing but behaviorism and has been heavily reinforced, of course, by Freud on the one hand and by B.F. Skinner, whom my colleague says is a lost cause. I agree, but I think that his influence is far greater than some of us realize because he has permeated much of modern psychology. And if you read B.F. Skinner, if you read what he really teaches, he really insists that young people are to be manipulated. And so the, the school today is an arena of manipulation. I dislike the word social science because they're neither scientific nor social. Uh, but uh, many people use the phrase, and I admit it's hard to find another one. But political science today is in the hands of the behaviorists. History is fast becoming in the hands of the behaviorists. It's very hard today to find even a good college textbook in American history. We get an awful lot of junk from publishers who are eager to spread their wares before our eyes. I don't have enough time to read them all thoroughly, but I do look through them, and most of them I would not use. Sociology is behaviorist. Economics to a great extent, is behaviorist. Not all, I don't mean that. But the, the behavioralism has invaded not only the high school curriculum, but is rapidly marching on to its conquest of the college curriculum. And underneath it all lies some organizations, like the NEA, who are sponsoring these things. And don't tell me they're not, because they are. And they know exactly what they're doing. State superintendent of education are sponsoring it. Don't tell me they don't know what they're doing. Now, some of them may not. Having been part of some of these schools, they may not understand it. But it's about time they did. And, of course, boards of education do not really understand what's going on. Most of them get a report from the superintendent and say, that's fine, marvelous. A new building here, that's good education. A new building over there, that's even better education. We'll have a new football field, and that's the crowning apex. What about your library? That's another matter. Some will say, well, with the busing, you see this, they, they really can't use a library, so we don't need a big one. But if that logic applies, how come they can use a big football field? So today, education is a manipulative art in the hands of those who manipulate for the destruction of free enterprise and more particularly for the destruction of freedom and certainly for the historic concept of constitutional government in this country. You cannot get a high school textbook, to my knowledge, that even comes close to a proper, adequate discussion of the background or the meaning of the Constitution, let alone the real work done that convention. You would be surprised the great names of American history which are omitted or barely referred to in the average high school text.
I, this, this last autumn, was asked by the Southern Association to sit on the crediting commission for a certain high school. Uh, and my a professor of English uh, was also on the thing with me, and so we went. I feel it's my duty to do this sort of thing, and I also was curious. Now, the school was very gracious. The, the, the principal's a fine man. He's a nice person. Uh, and so, in, in the two days we were there, I, so that I knew what I was talking about, I made 24 different visits to the classes in history, social science. 24. I kept alive, which I had to turn in, of course. In one class, taught by one woman teacher, I had six exposures to the women's living movement, which had nothing to do with history, as much, certainly what she taught it didn't. I went to another class where a bright young basketball coach was endeavoring futilely to teach medieval history. The textbook was unbelievable. His method of teaching was to allow the students to sit in a circle because that made them existentially, uh, you know, in contact, and they mumbled through a, the textbook. He didn't correct it, he didn't enlighten it. The textbook was bad, and he was so happy that he was given a new exposure to education. Uh, the theme was the medieval lord generally beat his wife over the back to make her obey, uh, which was his own interpretation to a degree. In, in, in American history, the woman had told me she was so happy they'd gotten a good new textbook. Now, it just so happened that the previous textbook I knew quite well because many of my students had done practice teaching at school, and I kept up with them. It was no jewel, the other textbook. It was no great intellectual achievement, but it wasn't nearly as bad as a great new and very relevant textbook, which they were now using, which was much thinner and had no facts, at least uh, very few facts, because... Uh, she cheerfully explained to me that the idea of the course was not to teach facts, but to get the students to ask questions. And so they were asking plenty of questions for which she had no answer. And certainly the textbook had no answer. I asked her what she wanted me to write down the report. She said, well, what we really need is a round table instead of a square table. And so I dutifully wrote down that the teacher in question would love to have a round table in her classroom rather than a square table. I went in another classroom, 11th grade American history. And the teacher had them, oh, it was a wall of wall carpeting. The whole school was beautiful, really a beautiful place. Beautiful gardens outside. And he had them, these 11th grade students, he had them playing with electric trains, and others were playing with covered wagons, and they were investigating the means by which the pioneers went west. And here they had these little covered wagons with little, they had little hills made out of paper on this beautifully carpeted floor. And they were going over the hills to illustrate the Alleghenies, the Appalachians, and Cumberland Mountains, you know, and the Rockies and so forth. While others were illustrating the overland limit and on all the great Union Pacific trains as they would dash by these little lumbering covered wagons. Now, you say once that's okay, but I went that class six <coughs> times, and six times they were doing the same thing, and throughout the entire period I was in that man's room, he didn't teach a single fact. It's surprising. And I came away in sheer disgust. There was one teacher who was doing her job, and that was an evangelical who, under a program sponsored by the churches, was teaching Bible in that high school. And I, her, her class was the oasis. I went for spiritual academic refreshment. To begin with, she had discipline. I felt safe. And the students were really learning their Bible. But it was an elective course, obviously. I, she had about, in the classes I was, I'd say she had probably 30 each. Possibly 35. It was, it was, it was a good course in terms of numbers and achievement. That was the one oasis.
the rest of it was a de Sahara desert of intellectual wastelands. And I would suggest that sometime you might want to read Mortimer Smith's great book and madly teach. And then a girl by the name of Joanne read The Retreat from Learning, which is a vivid description of why she left teaching. She barely escaped with her life from stabbing, rape, and a few other problems, not to mention she was a graduate, she was a young Roman Catholic graduate of Manhattanville College in New York City, or Manhattan College, who went gaily into the schools under the, under the horrible illusion that she was going to teach Shakespeare. And she found out that you have to use English to teach Shakespeare, which was a totally new idea to her, and that the people she was going to teach Shakespeare to never heard of English. And so she retreated from the battle, bloody, wounded, disillusioned, but still living, which she regarded as a great achievement.